So uh, yeah, this is more of a side project and it kind of started because like in the beginning I was uh, interested in reaching out to translators of evolutionary biology into Arabic. So uh, uh, well, that didn't really work out because I couldn't find the translators, but yeah, so I got the presentation out of it. So I will uh, I will go through uh, a little bit about popular science in general, and then uh, where is popular science published in Arabic, and then uh, my research question for this presentation, and then um, a little bit about my theoretical framework, which includes a voice and translation pack, and both of them are. Uh, basically from the um, uh, Alpstad, uh, Cecilia Alpstad and her group. Uh, and it's, it's very active in uh, uh, Scandinavian area. And then a little bit about analysis and then some conclusions. So uh, <clears throat> uh, popular science in general is it's basically like a, an intersection between science and uh, journalism in general or media. So it's basically science for the general public. So it can be also called science popularization and it's also uh, very prominent in science news. And uh, it includes like uh, broadly conceived, it includes written texts, it includes documentaries, science museum, citizen science um, initiatives, and like other things. And it is aimed uh, mainly at an educated readership with an interest in science. So, uh, for Arabic, like Arabic popular science, I was mainly it, like for the written, like at least the yeah written dissemination of it. Uh, I was able to find it in basically four different um, sources. So there is books about uh, like scientific um, topics for the general public. There is some dedicated periodicals, um, journals, and magazines. There is also. Uh, some science sections in print and online media, and there is a volunteer-based website. So it's basically uh, websites run by volunteers and uh, publish uh, volunteer translations and uh, written pieces about science. And uh, for today, I will focus on the uh, dedicated periodicals, which is basically um, a journal or a magazine that is completely for uh, science and uh, completely for uh, for the general public. And uh, for 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 this uh, presentation, I focused on three uh, publications. So the first one is uh, Nature Arabic edition. So nature is kind of, at least in, in English, it's, a, it's kind of a hybrid. So it, it's a weekly publication in English and it publishes uh, uh, some like popular science material, but it also publishes um, peer-reviewed um, articles. But the Arabic edition, they don't translate any of the peer-reviewed articles, only abstracts and they translate the other materials. So uh, yeah, the, um, the Arabic edition, it was launched in 2012. It's, uh, it was launched in Saudi Arabia, it's published in Saudi Arabia, and it's, uh, it received, it is actually published by Macmillan, uh, Macmillan Limited. So it's an um, international publication, but it's um, funded by uh, funded by uh, a government organization or a public uh, organization in Saudi Arabia, which is uh, King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology. And it is, uh, it 
it has uh, it has a print uh, um, it has print issues. So it started as a monthly publication, but then it switched into a quarterly um, about three years ago. It also has a website that has materials that are that don't show like that don't appear in the um, in the print publication. And the second one is. Uh, Popular science, and this one, uh, like the Arabic edition, opted to uh, to have uh, an Arabic name. So, so it's not just simply as like the Arabic edition; it's actually called uh, Science for the Public, something, something like that. Uh, it was launched in 2007, uh, 2017 and published in United Arab Emirates. Also, public funding by uh, Dubai Future Foundation. But it's published by a, a local uh, publisher in uh, in the UAE, and it also has a print publication uh, by monthly, so every two months, and it also has a website that um, that contains like content that doesn't appear in the print publication. And the last one is uh, Scientific American, and. Um, the Arabic name would translate as for science and it actually started like when it started in 2016 it was called the scientific Egyptian so uh, I don't think the name fared very well but anyway uh, so yeah uh, it's also uh, yeah, it's, it's from Egypt this one and this one is private funding and it's, uh, it's actually public uh, published by Springer Nature which is uh, the publisher of Scientific American, and this one it doesn't have a print publication, so it's completely uh, online uh, on a website, and it's um, it's free for um, for anyone who likes it. It's no, it's not subscription based. So my question is that uh, how visible is the translator in in those periodicals? So. I tried to trace the translators of these uh, periodicals um, within five years, so it's 2016 to 2020. But before I go through that, I will just uh, briefly introduce my uh, theoretical framework. So uh, the theory that I'm using for this is uh, Translation Pact, uh, which was proposed by uh, Al Kitab around 2014, um, it's basically uh, a, pro a proposition that uh, publishers and agents producing translations um, they invite the readers to read translations as if they were originals, and um, like. On the reader side, they may accept or they may challenge the pact. So, for example, accepting the pact would be manifested in something like, you know, reviews of translations, uh, just talking about the author and the author's idea, and they completely forget that they are actually reviewing a translation. Or they can challenge it by actually starting uh, to discuss the translation, or like, how good is the translation, how bad is the translation. So they are kind of uh, challenging the pact. So, and the pact is like, uh, as um, conceived by Altstadt, it does not include um, like pseudo-originals or something that is not announced as a translation. So it only includes uh, publications that are, that the reader knows that it's a translation, that's like it's, this fact is not being uh, is not being hidden, or there's no uh, uh, this, like uh, the publishers are not trying to hide this fact. But of course, the fact can like the the fact that something is a translation can be uh, more obvious or less obvious. It depends on the publisher or the setting. And I'm also using the uh, notion of voice in. Uh, also from Alstad and her uh, uh, and her 
group like research group um, which is basically uh, based in Norway but it's also very active in other Scandinavian uh, countries and for for Alvstad and her group voice basically is um, how the individual or collective conceptions and attitudes are expressed by publishers, translators, and others in both contextual material and the translated texts themselves. And uh, yeah, I opted for this because it's more uh, it's more descriptive compared to other uh, frameworks that study voice in translation, such as, for example, the famous one, uh, Benuti's. Uh, which is more ideological, more, uh, um, so this one is more descriptive, which suited my purposes. So for, uh, according to this uh, conceptual uh, framework, voice can be either contextual or textual. And the contextual voices we can see in uh, paratexts mainly, so paratexts include covers, the name of the author, translator, the name of the translator, copyright pages, editorials, notes, etc. So anything around the translation that is included in the product. And uh, textual voices is more uh, implicit, like it's only in the text and uh, you can only uh, get uh, you can only see, like hear it, I guess, like if we follow the metaphor, uh, only in the text itself. So it includes like uh, things like, like in my case, for example, terminology, glossing, but it also includes narrative voices in the, in literature. And yeah. So uh, some results, so this is like the, what I try to do is to see where is the, <clears throat> where is the translator in, in the contextual voices. Is he mentioned or is translation in general mentioned in the contextual, uh, in paratextual material uh, in the three publications. Um, so I went through the editorials, I went through the copyright pages of all the issues published 2016, 2020. And uh, yeah, for the first journal, uh, Nature, so translators were uncredited, like this, uh, like in the articles themselves or in the uh, pieces that are featured in, in the issues and on the website, uh, only the name of the author was mentioned and it was translated into Arabic, but the name of the translators were not mentioned. And there is also uh, in the editorials of all the issues, there was no mention at all of translators or the, trans or the, the like, translation in general. So translators and translation was not discussed. So they were basically uh, introducing the, um, like the research in the issue and the topics and the, and they were talking as if, you know, as if the authors wrote this in Arabic mainly. And these editorials, of course, are produced by the Arabic edition editors. So it's, it's not a, like, in itself, it's not a translation. It is written by, mainly by the editor in chief of the Arabic edition in most cases, or someone deputizing for him or her. So um, yeah, in 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 this uh, in this publication, the translators may have been credited, but very uh, indirectly. And uh, there is like in the copyright uh, page, there is a section called participants in the issue, and um, it includes usually around 20, 20 something names. And I tried to uh, Google some of those names and I got some results uh, like uh, from LinkedIn, for example, that they are translators. So they, it, like it might be, but not yet. 
it's, it's not like from the issue itself is not it's not obvious at all and in nature there was also a translation consultant was credited uh, there was also a translation team leader and a translation managing editor so here for for nature the translation pack like the the sign that this is a translation um, <clears throat> is only prepared uh, by the publisher through the logo, which is in, kept in English. Um, and uh, in, on the website, uh, there is also a link to the original article. So for uh, the second one, popular science, the translators are also uncredited. Uh, in print and online, so same as nature, and there is uh, no mention at all of translators or translation in editorials, so again, same case. And um, in here, the, like in the copyright page, there is no translation credits at all, so there is, um, like, just looking at it, like, you wouldn't know that uh, this is a translated journal. So you can only kind of guess that from the author names, again, which were uh, translated into Arabic, transliterated into Arabic, so they appear in Arabic letters, but they are foreign names. So, um, so this is basically the only indication other than the title, like the logo, which is again kept in English, popular science. So here it's only, the translation pact is only, um, proposed by, by the publisher through the logo. And uh, uh, lastly, the, for Scientific American, so again, translator, translators are not uh, mentioned in the articles. And here, uh, yeah, the translator pact, this, one, this is only online, so uh, the, translation, uh, the translation pact is only prepared through the logo again, and there is also a link to the source article for each translated article. And in the about page, they mention that this is like this is a translation, like that they translate from Scientific American, and then they talk about Scientific American, the uh, um, the original publication. So for uh, an investigation of textual voices, like. I think for for science it's not really uh, that obvious compared to literature, um, at least. So I only looked at two features. So terminology. Um, I noticed that in some cases um, some terms are explained, and like these are examples of terms that are explained, so they are not terminologized, um, like speciation, human evolution. So there is like, it's just explained, like there is no single term for it. Um, and it's, um, this feature of course, like uh, is kind of like a translator intervention. So in a way, this is the voice of the translator in the translation. And it, it wasn't really, it wouldn't be noticeable, noticeable to the readers unless they, uh, they compare to the source. And the other feature is that uh, it's called glossing in Arabic, uh, for for at least for the Arabic context. Um, and basically, it's um, keeping uh, some of the English terms, like you see in the example. So here, it's like the the, the Arabic term is given, followed by the English acronym. And, and the second example again, like the Arabic term is given. Uh, and then followed by the English term. But uh, this phenomenon is actually not, um, um, it, it, it's not just in translation in Arabic, it's also um, in scientific uh, writings uh, published in Arabic, um, original, like original Arabic. And um, Sharka studied that and, and she found that in non-translated Arabic texts as well. So to wrap up, uh, very exciting results. 
uh, yeah, so <laughs> translators are virtually invisible in those three uh, publications, and they're very, like, very prominent publications, but there's no translator there, as if, you know, like the text um, translated itself. And so they are completely missing in contextual voices, and they have a very faint textual voice. Um, publishers of the three periodicals, they offer a very loose translation pack. They try as much as possible to hide the fact that this is a translation. And um, yeah, translation like translators are not part of the translation pack at all. So it's basically just the publishers. And uh, yeah, basically like the punchline, I guess, would be that yeah, inv invisibility in of the translators in um, in scientific translation in general, it's it's a common uh, it's a common issue, and it has been uh, reported in. Uh, uh, this is a special. This is actually an introduction to a special issue by Olohan and Salamakar like uh, a while ago, and they noticed that uh, invisibility of the translator in um, in science. Uh, in general is like a uh, translator is the most invisible in, in that area. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohamed, for shedding light on these cheeky periodicals and for being on time. Uh, do we have any questions for Mohamed? Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, why do you think um, these um, translators are like uh, invisible? Just crossed my mind that uh, maybe that it's their choice to stay anonymous. Just, just my idea that you know to protect their identity in case the translation uh, creates some kind of uh, problem with the cultural sensitivity. Is that possible? I don't know. I'm just speculating. Uh. Yeah, I mean, this is just con conjecture on my side, but I don't think so. I think it's mainly an editorial uh, choice, and um, it's just the case of editors um, of those publications who think that translation are not, uh, like that translation is kind of like a, like let's say, it's not, a, like, it's, it's not that important, so you know, editing is more important and the content itself is more important, but translation is no like anyone can do this or, you know. So it's, it's more of a lack of appreciation of the translation process rather than uh, some, like a choice by translators. I'm not really, I know much about translation of science, but similarly to like when people study translation of the Bible or, or religious texts, where people don't want to, uh, regarding this translation pack, when they read it, they, they want to think that they're reading the actual word, the original. Um, and so the translator being a, an interference in that and like they, them having difficulty in trusting the, the research and knowing that there, is good, there, there has been uh, an intermediary. Um, and they have, they might have betrayed, um, you know, the data or whatever. Uh, what is there? Is there? Is there? A, there's probably stuff in the translation of, sci of uh, sciences about that. But uh, could you talk more about that in, in the sense of invisibility? Yeah, um, yeah. It links actually to an idea in um, in like it has to do with translate, like the sorry with um, with science language, like with science in general, with scientific discourse. So there is the idea that scientific discourse is universal discourse. So you know the language is just a, it's kind of like a mathematical equation. Like you can just like you know that like if you move from one language to another, that nothing will change, which is I guess a simplistic way of looking at translation. But it it is a it's a it's a prevalent. Uh, conception, I guess, or um, a prevalent idea in scientific circles that translation is just, you know, yeah, it's, it's a mechanical process that, that does not, that won't change the, the content, 
and this is actually what uh, yeah this is what I'm addressing in, in my in my uh, in my research actually James will know a little bit about that by now so it's uh, yeah like the idea is that you know culture which is like you know language is based in culture right so uh, that culture does not have that doesn't have anything to do with how science is translated and this is a prevalent idea and it has been theorized in and scientific discourse, and it also has been challenged. So yeah, it, it's a it's an ongoing discourse, uh, like a, an ongoing debate, I guess, about that in within scientific circles. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, okay, The journals used some technical translation, some, some I don't know, um, like online translators, and then edited them the the, the text. So maybe maybe there are no no people behind this text, and that's why that's why there are no names. Can, can it be the case? Uh, no. <laughs> answer. Uh, because I, I, I am collecting a corpus as well for like all, the, all these translations, uh, but it's only about evolution. And I can tell you for sure, like looking at the texts that and, and the translations as well, like the original and the Arabic, is that this has been um, translated by humans for sure. And I don't think machine translation. Like in general, machine translation for Arabic. Like yeah, I've been also a translator, and that helps a little bit. So uh, so I know that you know, like you can see if there, if even if it was like a machine translation is then post edited, you will see that uh, at least you will get a feel of it if you if you have enough text. And in in these cases, no, it's like there is actually quite big shifts in the text to uh, to exclude. Um, machine translation. So I think it was translated by humans, for sure. Um, and it's also uh, like, yeah, both, like all like these three pub like uh, publications, they have offices. So mm -hmm. they have a, like, a, there is an office in Saudi Arabia and they hire translators. There is a, like the publisher in, in, uh, in UAE. Uh, they also hire translators. The office in, in Cairo also has translators, um, but yeah, they are just not credited. So, and I think some of the work is done like internally, um, and some of the work is also uh, freelancers, like uh, is commissioned by like to freelancers. Um, but yeah, so the like the short answer is that yeah, there are human translators for sure. It's just you can't really get a hold of them, I guess, like, for editorial, uh, for, like, the, it's, like, by choice of the editors, basically, or the publishers of these, uh, of these publications. Maya, yeah, did you have the same question? No, it's a follow-up. Oh, so it's kind of a follow-up to Anna's question. Um, it's about motivation, because he, is this, uh, uh, exploratory research, or did you actually find when you were reading, when you were researching for your thesis, and then you read, uh, you saw that a translator was mentioned, and then you thought, well, what if this is the common practice? Were you just trying to find out whether it is or not, or you actually saw one being there, and then you thought, maybe this is common practice, and then you found out it's not? Uh, yeah, like this, like, uh, yeah, it comes back to my original, like, my original idea for for my uh, for my research, I was thinking of um, supplementing my corpus um, approach with some interviews with translators about you know translating uh, evolution uh, materials because you know evolution in Arabic is a kind of a, um, sensitive topic. So like, how do they deal with that, etc. But so I started looking at like some. Uh, uh, publications to see if I, I can actually find, you know, if I can track translators, and I was kind of surprised that uh, there isn't any. Like, I, it would be it would be very very difficult to actually get uh, 
get to get a hold of translators, so I kind of abandoned the idea. So now I'm just uh, yeah, I'm just uh, studying texts now. So uh, no interviews. So yeah, so this is uh, this was my motivation to to look for the translators. Uh, so yeah, when. When I saw the call for papers, I remembered this experience, so it, it made sense to, to make a, kind of a presentation about it. So. Thanks. Um, this is kind of... Oh. You have to, oh. You have to speak straight into the middle. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to this. Um, so it's kind of a follow-up to another question from before. Um, so, you just said that it's a sensitive topic. Um, have you thought of the possibility that maybe um, the translators weren't uh, credited because of that, because no one wanted to have the responsibility? Um, because if it is written by someone else from a foreign country, you can always like um, um, say it's their responsibility and we don't, I don't know, we don't publish anything on our behalf that is sensitive, that is political in that context? Uh, yeah, that would have made sense if, it's, if these publications are only uh, about evolution, right? Yeah. But it's about science in general, it's about science and technology, so it, it has all scientific uh, uh, disciplines, basically. So evolution is actually quite a minority in, in, in the content. And that has something to do as well with, with the sensitivity of evolution. So for example, in popular science, uh, throughout the five years, maybe there's like two, I think, or three articles in all the issues that is actually about, like that mention evolution in passing. So um, yeah, in nature, it's, it's different. Like in nature, maybe out of, um, in, like in each issue, you would have something like uh, one or two um, texts out of maybe, 70 or 65, I think, like 60 to 70 texts per issue. That is about evolution. So it, it's not really like these publications are not a, about evolution. So it's and it's like in science, only evolution is it's sensitive, more, more or less, uh, or at least it's the most sensitive. Most other, um, like you know, like if you're talking about, uh, you know, about the stars and planets, and it, it's not sensitive at all, right? It's just science. So there is no reason, you know, not to credit uh, translators because of that. So yeah, it's um, uh, yeah. I don't think so. I don't think it's because of this sensitivity. It makes more sense, for example, if uh, like you know, dedicated books about evolution has like you know, no translators. But uh, for for general publications like this, like you know, that just you know about science in general. Um, yeah, I don't think it has something to do with, with sensitivity. Sorry. Last question, just a very short one. I was wondering um, if you looked at any other scientific journals in other languages and how they deal with the translator question, if they credit them or if it seems to be something that's specific to Arabic speaking journals. Yeah, I tried. Uh, well, I didn't look myself, so I didn't do any primary research. But I tried looking for um, uh, literature uh, about this, and um, I couldn't find any. So it would be, yeah, I mean, it would be, uh, it would be interesting to compare this across languages as well. But yeah, as I said, there is, I, I like the literature that I found was only kind of very general that. Uh, in in a sense, like when Oliver and Salam Akar, for example, was talking about, you know, uh, science translation. So she was, um, she she mentioned that that science, like the translators, are most invisible in, in science in terms of translation. So but I, I didn't really uh, compare, but I think at least for. For the French edition, for example, the French edition of uh, Scientific American, I think that translators are uh, are mentioned. Uh, but yeah, like I, I didn't really do a, a methodological um, like search about that. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, I think we can move to our second poster presentation.